So we're, we're bil building this as a fireside conversation. Um, I think we should have rethought that title, Fireside, you know? No, and you know, it's like, exactly. And it's kind of that thing that happens in gentlemen's clubs, you know, when they have the fire and the, and the men gather and talk as if they're running the world. But this is a different though, with an alternative on the theme. It's really good to have both of you here or with us and making the time. Um, and it's a shame, I wish we could have flipped it the other way because I think the audience should hear from both of you uh, in terms of what you're both doing. Um, and it's, it's great to have you, uh, I, suppose, uh, I suppose, wrap the conversation up in a way in terms of what you both as women leading uh, organisations are and how you're changing changing the narrative, if you like, uh, from inside organizations. Lisa, it's great that you've been able to make it here. I'm going to start with you. Um, you've, you've gone from one household name to another, Obama to Apple. And, you know, because, you know, you did that job really well and you chose to go into Apple. Say a little bit about that, would you, in terms of what made you make that change, but also how that continued your journey, if you like. Thank you so much. And hello to everyone here and uh, online. It's really an honor to be here and especially to be in Europe as a former regulator to thank you personally for keeping the conversation about climate and circularity going through the ups and downs of policy making uh, around the world. Uh, and your leadership is appreciated and needed at this time. Um, so, to go from uh, President Obama to my CEO and boss, uh, Tim Cook, was actually uh, an interesting journey. Mm. I, you know, I did four years, the first term of Obama's administration. Um, and when you leave that, and it's important to know, I was 25 years in the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. I started as a staff level engineer. Wow. Um, wow. And so, of course, first the honor of being able to come back and lead an organization that I really, I don't want to say grew up in, but my career developed in. Uh, yeah. Most of what I learned, I learned there. So to be able to lead that team of incredibly dedicated and talented professionals was the honor of a, of a public service lifetime. Um, when the time was over, um, I actually got a call from Tim, who I'd met uh, back when he was still COO of Apple. Um, and he invited me to come and visit Apple. And uh, I should have known then, yeah. but he clearly did, that it would be really hard to resist thinking about a future there. And the reason is quite simple. Um, really, the, the one thing about the honor of being an um, environmental protection agency administrator is that you make decisions that have real impact, for good and for bad, hopefully mostly for good. And EP Apple, we feel, should be the same way not because we want to take power away from government, but because the private sector also has a really important role in our transition to um, uh, a low carbon, sustainable uh, um, future. And so to think about having the opportunity to go now back to, I'm actually an engineer by training, so there was a time in my life I thought I would be in the private sector. The, the public right. sector was kind of my big surprise. Yeah. Uh, so to be able to go back and work with the very talented people at Apple um, and you know achieve the things we've done. 2018, we became 100% renewable energy. 2020, uh, carbon neutral. Um, and the work we've done, which we'll talk more about on mm -hmm. circularity and the incredible partnership with Pace has just really been the next, the next phase. I'm very, very fortunate. Thank no, great. And thank you for sharing that, because I, I, I didn't know about that little bit about that. You actually came in really young, and then suddenly you're at the top of the organization internally there. Um, you've, made a, you've made a commitment. So Apple's made this commitment to be, you know, across the supply chain, 2030. Um, share with us what that looks like for you in terms of managing that transition. That's a big deal. I, mean, I know you know it's a big deal, but you know, <laughs> people know that you, you have, you, it is quite complex, the supply chain that you have. Yeah, thank you. Um, it goes back to impact again. So uh, in 2020, of course, Paris was what we were all thinking mm. about, and we challenged ourselves to do as much more as we could, as fast as we could, because we believe that we should do, take on some of the hard challenges in our sector, in the tech sector, on behalf of, of our sector. Um, and we are manufacturers, um, we make hardware. And so that presented an opportunity as well. So we made a pledge and we call it Apple 2030, that by 
2030, every single device that we sell will be carbon neutral. What does it mean to be carbon neutral by 2030 for a device? Of course it means that the supply chain needs to run on clean energy. So we are in the process of moving our suppliers um, to clean energy. We have 250 of our suppliers who represent well over 80% of our spend already committed to clean energy for their Apple supply. But there's another side of that. Once we make and manufacture a device, okay, it's got a zero carbon footprint, but the minute it's purchased and a user takes it and plugs it in to charge it, it's also drawing energy potentially from a grid with a carbon footprint. So we have to also think about that energy. It's part of our responsibility the way we see it. So to, so to sell a carbon neutral device by 2030, we also have to put energy on grids around the world to cover our customers' mm. energy needs. Along the process, we also added a couple of other things. Number one, our devices have always been known for how long they last, how durable they are. The, the quality of an Apple device is oftentimes why people are drawn to them, along with privacy. That's something we're also known for. So we wanted that durability and longevity to be balanced with repairability, which I know is a big discussion yeah. here as well. And last but not least, we wanted to make the most out of every resource we use. The world has finite resources. We're using some of them. So we made a real determination that we wanted as much of our product, we say 100%, to be made of recyclable or renewable materials. So those are the journeys we're on, mm. and we're doing pretty well. Good to know. I mean, I can say, you know, that's not uh, because you're just Apple and you're here, but it will be great when I think it will be a sense of, especially when you think about the younger generation that's coming through, to have this, knowing that it's completely, you know, out of repair and reuse, you know, renewable product will be a win. But it also be a symbol, but also a, a learning tool as well, that you can do that as well as make sure you're protecting the planet. Thank you for that. I'm going to turn to Ramona. Ramona, thank you also for being here. You've done all, uh, equally and also wonderful things in terms of making sure um, this agenda is right up there with the private sector, and obviously your partnership with Apple is a testament to that. Collaboration is key for you, as I understand it. Can you, you know, say a little bit about the collaborative practice that needs to be in place if we're going to get there? Because it's not all private sector, it's not all public sector. We need the two to play together in the nicest way. Of course, uh, more than the nicest way. I think um, I actually almost had the opposite journey, which was starting in finance and energy investment and then making my way through blended finance into this rather peculiar position and very privileged position um, of leading PACE, which is the platform for accelerating the circular economy. Um, in that, we work with a, a number of real leaders um, in their sectors who have not only ambition for themselves, the way Apple does for their own portfolio and products, but are actually trying to co-create the foundations for a better world. Um, we talk a lot about decarbonization and circular economy interchangeably, but the circular economy represents one big step further on where we're going to have to rewire an awful lot of things. As I like to say a lot, um, you know, everything, everywhere, all at once. Mm. We need a better foundation for the economy. We need social nature and environment to all be hand in hand in decisions. And we need to make that affordable and democratic and inclusive. We need good jobs. So you know, seeing many of the speakers here this morning, you see how our world has really tried to silo us into different places, one person advocating for nature, one person for good jobs. Exactly, yeah. But with our partnership, uh, which must be by default both public and private, private. Uh, we're trying to advocate for, for all of it together. And to achieve that integrated vision, one of the interesting things is that companies like Apple, who have been in the leadership position, have discovered that it's actually much harder to do that in today's world, um, and have been trying to, to uncover sort of the hidden challenges or barriers, but also the hidden opportunities that lie in our production systems. Too often, this question about a circular economy is seen as people having to give things up. But as Lisa's just mentioned with reference to Apple's you know, products, and there are many, many other examples, if you actually re-engineer the production systems mm. and shared infrastructure to do things like, for example, collect minerals and materials that are already out of the ground and avoid putting the kind of pressure on our systems that we can ill afford at this time, we can ensure that everyone has a sufficiency without having to make it sound as if ordinary citizens will have to give up things they hold dear. And it's that nature of shared ambition 
and shared infrastructure. You do not want 100 companies trying to create a collection infrastructure, for example, and you certainly don't want them doing it outside of partnership with their municipalities or communities. So the kind of public partnership for things like shared mobility, exemplified by DriveNow, those are the sorts of partnerships that we are trying to build. Um, in the energy and digital systems, in food production systems, and bringing together net zero and decarbonization. Before I go back to Lisa, you've talked about the importance of that collaborative principle, but also about thinking more wisely about um, how you create um, an infrastructure, if you like, that it doesn't require many parts. You can actually you can share appropriately and move uh, efficiently. How? How, I mean, well, have you or share experiences where the multi-stakeholder discipline um, has driven change that's important? Because people talk about it, uh, do a little of it, uh, and that's going to be key. And I want to bring Lisa into that later. But for, for you first, tell me a little bit, share your thinking on that. Sure. Um, I think change happens in a context. Um, and one example I would point to would be, for example, we're working with um, the Catalan regional government in an industrial symbiosis pilot uh -huh. um, that brings together about a dozen companies who are trying to share as much as possible of their own resources. Um, one company's trash is someone else's treasure um, and so on. But also they have a vision um, to create better jobs in the community and better protection for biodiversity, as well as greater resilience commercially. So um, personally, I think that in the industrial and production world, there's a chance to take what's worked very well in the landscape approach for things like regenerating nature. Um, because when people can actually see it and feel it and it's part of their community and they, and they own it, that's when you actually get the true outcome of things like prosperity for all. Um, and this involves companies working in a very different way with their suppliers, not telling them what to do, but sort of building a shared vision together. And many of our corporate leaders like Apple are actually engaging in very different kinds of discussions with their suppliers than they would have done in the past. It's not a value chain as much as it is a network of shared value creation that happens in a place that actually benefits um, all the people who live in that place. And I think that is the kind of vision that I wasn't hearing perhaps as much of in no, the discussion today. Indeed. And I think we need to hear more about. You need, absolutely. But it feel, feels a bit like Nirvana, though, Ramona, Ramona, in the sense that if you're in a locality like the, the you know, a geographical space, but when your supply chain is global, how you create that sense of shared? Because I was, you know, my, my ears picked up when you said you've got this many suppliers who've already signed up to do the thing that you want to do. So if I can turn to you, that you know, how are you designing for manufacturing for circularity when you think of your vast supply chain, which is global? Yeah, thank you. L let me, maybe I can just give some real world examples of how that's working, and yeah. it will bring it home a little bit. So. We say to our suppliers that we want to be 100% recycled material. When, when it comes to something like uh, our sector, we actually have to go about the innovation to be able to use those materials. You know, um, an Apple product is an incredible feat of engineering, and part of that is material scientists and, and engineers who spend lots of time on durability, on cosmetics, on weight, on you know malleability, all these things. Mm. I'm not a, a mechanical engineer. I'm a chemie by training, so forgive me. But um, all that work has to happen on the upfront to t to be able to take what, by definition, is a much more diverse incoming stream of material, but still have it turn out. Our goal is really simple. We don't want you to be able to tell the difference between a product that has recycled content and one that doesn't, because we don't want. Uh, we don't want our customers to feel that something had to be given up. We want both. We want circularity and we want quality and durability. That's really important to us. And we feel like it's a challenge that we can meet. So our engineers are working on this side to design and spec and test and qualify yeah. all these materials. Now we have to go to the supply chain. Those materials don't necessarily exist. Mm and spec to them, hey, you know how you've been buying material in the commodities market for a long time? Mm, how about buying something else? Yeah. And remember, they're buying it, we aren't. So yeah. it's really using the influence of our global supply chain, thank you, our scale, our leadership, our power in that way to move the supply chain mm. to a demand for recycled materials. If you have a demand for recycled materials, now you need the materials to come in Indeed. to be recycled. So we've also invested in things like our robots that disassemble iPhone, Daisy and Dave and Taz, because those components, tiny as they are, 
have a huge impact if we can get rare earth elements back out or tantalum or tin or gold. So let me just give you a couple of ideas of how that works. The, the new MacBook Air, the most recent one I believe it is, has 40% recycled material in it. That cut the carbon footprint by 30%. So right there, my Apple 2030 goal is very happy. I'm getting closer without having done anything on the energy side yeah. or the offsite or anything on that side of the equation. But we're also meeting this other goal uh, as well. And if you wrap that up around all of our products, we're about 20% recycled material in our products by weight across all of the products that we sell. Our carbon footprint has gone down about uh, 45%. And our, at the same time, and that's our total footprint, um, our revenue has gone up 68%. So it's the key for us mm. to breaking the tie between consumption or revenue and carbon footprint is that the materials that you use to start the process are inherently much lower carbon than what we have been using a long time. And we're training a whole supply chain around that. And having pace is incredibly important so that they have a home, a place where that kind mm. of learning and sharing can be multiplied across um, others. So they're not operating at a disadvantage, but it's a level playing field. Because I mean, what you demonstrated there is what you can do when you are a powerful, uh, iconic brand like yourself, but with the power of capital behind you to shift a whole supply chain, right? And it's quite important that others are able to see that the art of the possible and the art of the you know, what you can imagine differently. Uh, and I hope that, you know, uh, you're able to share that story with other your CEOs or others that actually this isn't too difficult if you've got the scale. Actually, no, it's the other way around. If you've got the vision, <laughs> if you've got the vision and then you've got, you can use your scale. So I hope that, you know, we can see more of that. I mean, you seeing more of that vision coming through from the old CEOs? Not just from CEOs, Darmendra, but yeah. also from regions. So right. again, PACE is a public-private partnership. So I would point to, for example, the region of Western Queensland, um, a fellow board member on PACE's board yeah. uh, is a minister there. She included, at the same time, some of the most aggressive targets on circularity in a mining region, as well as some of the most stringent on biodiversity. It can be done. It just has to be done together. Um, I think what, what I really appreciate about our, our members like Apple and others um, is we, we, in a way, select them for their leadership on, on the triple opportunity, yeah. not on one or another. Um, it's, uh, it needs to be all, all of these things at once, otherwise it won't actually work. If people only pursue decarbonization and they only take a technological path to doing it, we're not actually creating a better world or better alternatives. Mm -hmm. And we're also not showing what's possible. So all of the, the regions, the companies, and the organizations that form part of PACE have that sort of triple triply important vision in mind, and often collaborate together as a result. Briefly, how much of this is a gender issue? Um, no, I mean, come on. What I mean by that is we know that neuroscience suggests that women are able to, when you've got more of them in a, in a boardroom, better decisions happen. We see a different leadership style happening in terms of being more foresight, uh, taking risks differently, etc. I just want a quick reaction to that. Is, it, is this, I mean, are we seeing more women in your, especially in your position, Lisa, that actually are, you can see a mirror images of you around the world? Yeah, I'm starting to, and I think, listen, I think like in many things in society, women are finally being able to be seen. They've been leading for a long time, exactly. but not necessarily been out front in their leadership. So it's very good, and I have often said, especially when I mentor young women, that, uh, you know, the key to saving the world is empowering women and young girls so that we have them on the playing field as well. Thank you. Because I think was, I, I didn't want to leave that issue out because it may as well be open and visible about it. Thank you both. I think what's going to be interesting is how companies like yourself and some of your, your, your partners are able to use the uh, advertising. Uh, you see it increasingly. How, you know, peop uh, companies are using the power of film uh, like short films, to really nudge behavior. It's the power of, uh, you know, power of peers, uh, and you can actually see uh, people shifting to a different dimension, not only in terms of head, but also purchasing power. So thank you both for being with us. It's been great. And great. Thank you both. <laughs>